So hello everyone, welcome to another deep adaptation Q&A with me, Jem Bendel. And my guest today, who we're going to have an hour with, uh, is Reverend Michael Dowd. And uh, I just want to say a, a few things about Michael. Many of you probably know him because of his output in this area. But um, he has a background as a liberal Protestant minister. Uh, Reverend Michael Dowd is now known as uh, a post-doom pastor. And that's a concept that we're going to delve into in the next hour together. Michael's a prolific producer of video presentations and sermons on aspects of collapse of modern societies, as well as creating, I think, probably the biggest catalogue of interviews with people who work on in this field. I think he also provides a really great service uh, to the public through reading a, a range of um, literature, both old and new, um, making it available on SoundCloud. I've certainly benefited from his work in that way. And he does it all with um, a clear relish for intellectual insight and free thinking that I think manages to offset some of the heaviness of the material that he's covering. Um, and this topic, we know it's emotionally difficult, not just the topic, but also the way people can respond to us uh, when we talk about it with others or talk about it publicly. So I think Michael's very way of being in relation to this global predicament we're in um, reminds me of the, the kind of um, uplift of energy and sense of freedom that you can get, uh, freedom from previous preoccupations. So there's this uh, sense of post-doom, no gloom, that, that, that Michael embodies extremely well. And so we're going to hear about some of the, the basis for that, as well as just experience some of that uh, with Michael today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim. It's a great uh, privilege and uh, a delight to always speak with you, but to speak with you in this context is great. Yeah, it's good to finally finally ha have you on. Um, I'm some way behind you. I think I've produced about 36 or 37 uh, Q&A videos on collapsed topics, and you've done around 90, I think. Is that right? Yeah, just about 89, 80, 90, something like that. I think Sam Mitchell's probably ahead of me. He's done a lot. But. Okay, right. So I want to look at your particular take on this. And um, when we titled this session together, uh, we used the concept of religious failure. So I want to dive straight in with that. So um, how do you see uh, societal collapse, ecocide, and uh, possible human extinction as to do with religious failure. Um, yeah. I think that'd be really important to, to hear immediately. Sure. Well, where I go into that most deeply is my very latest video, which I think was titled Collapse, Ecocide, and Likely NTHE as Religious Failure. It's about 40 minutes long. But just the nutshell is, and I, and I really build on the scholarship of, as you know, William Catton, William Ophel's, uh, but especially Teddy Goldsmith. Edward Goldsmith was the founder and the editor of the Ecologist magazine for close to 40 years. Uh, and he, his magnum opus is The Way, an Ecological Worldview. But in 1978, he wrote a book called The Stable Society, which at that time, and really his book, The Way, that they both do this, which is they take a look at, he takes a look at the last five or 600 years of anthropological evidence and says, okay, what's our best historic and scientific understanding of the difference between genuinely sustainable cultures, cultures that can live in place without destroying the place for practically countless generations, certainly many generations, and those cultures that reliably, predictably always go into the overshoot collapse, overshoot collapse pattern. And so he, he basically defines religion, actually, as the control mechanism of stable, sustainable cultures. And what he means by mechanism is simply that aspect of society that speaks with moral authority that the future will not be compromised by the present upon pain of death or ostracizing in, in, in traditional cultures. And so that sense that, that the, the fundamental sacred role of what gets called religion in the West or in, in uh, you know, civilizations, but really could be seen as life ways, indigenous life ways, is that aspect of culture that not only ensures that the future will not be compromised by the present, but ensures on certain basic fundamentals, like what I'm calling and, and this is difficult because the word God has become so trivialized. It's become so 
otherworldly, supernatural, uh, unnatural, that to even use the word is confusing for people. And so what I'm speaking about is that religion, by not by having a concept of God that doesn't include our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end, the cosmos, the, the biosphere, what, you know, the living world, by not including our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end in its concept of God, we're left with a God that either can be believed in or disbelieved rather than a God that's inescapable. I mean, you don't believe in the biosphere, you don't, but, but we need to live in right relationship to the biosphere or we perish just like every other creature. So religion in traditional, stable, sustainable societies, Goldsmith identified as that moral, that moral voice within culture that insists on God first, that is life first or biosphere first, you know, the living world, the living as a greater thou not a lesser it. Once you step into thinking of the living world, not as a community akin, you know, as Daniel Wildcat says, Mm -hmm. we are surrounded by relatives, not resources. So once we begin to think of the living world as merely resources, you know, for us and a place for our waste, we've already stepped into an ecocidal trajectory that's guaranteed to go through the boom, the rise and fall boom and bust cycle. So what I say yeah. by religious failure is just that, that basically religion has not been fulfilling its evolutionary role or its ecological role. And it's understandable because the religions, the great religions of the last, say, four or five thousand years have all emerged in cultures that were totally unsustainable. So it's not like they were going to be able to hold the economic and political establishment, you know, to any kind of uh, moral, you know, in- guaranteeing of the integrity of the biosphere and that sort of thing so that's what i mean by that so there's yeah so that's really helpful there so understanding religion as a as a as a as a moral framework and if you have a religion which doesn't have life itself as central and seen as sacred understood as sacred then all manner of abuse uh can arise from that There's and it won't even be seen words. as abuse that's the thing mm-hmm. it won't even be seen mm-hmm. as abuse it's it's not seen framed that way at all it. yeah yeah exactly seen as progress exactly um, and so um a couple of big words in relation to this are anthropocentrism and desacralization the desacralization of nature i was i know you've you've done a video where you've talked about anthropocentrism uh as the root cause of, of pretty much all facets of what's going wrong in contemporary societies and then you've you're going a bit deeper on that topic now as well and you talk you use the phrase of being god blind but with the way that you write god uh, could you say something further about that sure sure thanks jim um yeah human centeredness where we where we prioritize human wealth human well-being the wealth of corporations the wealth of kings the wealth of emperors the you know gross domestic product or gdp or gnp when that is our measure of wealth and well-being rather than how well is the soil doing decade by decade how well are the forests doing decade by decade how well are the other species doing by decade by decade that's an ecocentric or life-centered measure of wealth well-being and success and again that's what all you know, sustainable cultures had, which is a life-centered rather than human-centered understanding. When I say God blind, G earth emoji D, what I mean is simply, or, and biosphere death, is that we don't treat the biosphere as if it's God. We don't treat the ecosphere as if it is our genuinely, which it is, our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. It is that. That's a fact. That's not a belief. But if we don't treat the living world as that, as kin, as a greater thou, not a lesser it, then we just think that progress is about taking from the living world, making stuff out of it, selling it, it goes to the waste heap, and we call that progress. In fact, the faster that happens, the more we think that we're in progress. So progress is utterly delusional because it interprets the word progress in human-centered rather than life-centered ways. So my understanding, it might be off here, but that you actually previously believed what you've just described for some decades Uh, and it was part of you being a religious naturalist and into um, uh, sort of conscious evolution and and, uh, the idea that being an epic of evolution that humans are part of possibly even at at the pinnacle of Uh, and so 
So you've retained some of the philosophy, but also ditched quite a quite a bit of it as well, as you've realized just how bad the damage that we've done to the biosphere has become. Could you say something about that shift that you've undergone? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So yes, since 1988, in 1988, I was introduced to the work of Joanna Macy, uh, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, uh, uh, Matthew Fox, Sally McFaig, Dwayne Elgin. I mean, just a lot of people who were really into the epic of evolution, the universe story. I think I became aware of David Corton somewhere around there. And yes, Connie and I have been involved in the epic of evolution or big history or the universe story for decades. In fact, our main website is thegreatstory.org. And what we mean by the great story is the story that includes all stories, all religious and secular stories. Of It's our modern day, our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story. The challenge is that it's been mostly interpreted in human-centered ways, and I interpreted it that way. Really only, I mean, I think I had a deeply ecological, bioregional, permaculture sort of worldview until around 2000. And I read several books in the, around the year 2000 that put me on a human-centered, unidirectional understanding of evolution and uh, a much more of a techno-utopian understanding. You know, from the caves to now to the stars was my worldview from, from about 2000 to, I think, December third of 2012 and then in fully getting not just climate change but abrupt climate change you know 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime that rocked me out of that kind of anthropocentric or human-centered interpretation of the big picture of the universe story and so the last eight or nine years I've been as you mentioned recording books and and posts related to the rise and fall of civilization relate related to uh, ecological overshoot um, and not just ecological overshoot, but also cultural and psychological overshoot. There's limits to, to human nature. There's limits to our human nature as individuals and as groups, and we can overshoot those limits as well. So we may not have time to get into that, but basically, yes, I think that interpreting the epic of evolution or universe story or even just, just evolution in itself in human-centered ways is always going to dilute us because we're going to not recognize that no, we're not the center of the universe. No, our form of consciousness is not more advanced. In fact, it's more problematic because we tend to treat our biophysical creator, sister and end, what I'm calling God, G Earth emoji D, as merely an it to be exploited. And so, yeah. So that's that's a massive change. I mean, I, I do know quite a lot of people who are, who are very reverent towards the biosphere and very critical of current societies and 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 yet also think that it what we need to do is get back to um a truth of why humans are on earth and and therefore do see us as somehow advancing uh, consciousness in the universe um and so there is still that sense of progress and getting somewhere as a species um and what you've just said is that mm, now that's still a bit anthropocentric and it's a it's, it's kind of still retaining some ideas which are at the root cause of all the mayhem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, John Michael Greer in one of his books uh, talks about, you know, that when you're when you're pressed up against a brick wall, you've driven down a blind alley, you press your car is pressed up against a brick wall. Uh, it doesn't help to rev the engine or to hope for some techno miracle. The only way to progress is to back up. And Robin Wall Kimmer speaks about the seventh fire, going back and getting the, the gifts from previous times. I'm all about people falling in love with life, with the biosphere, with, with the cosmos as, as a thou, as a being. Mm -hmm. um, I'm all about that, but not to transform things. We're, it's way, way, way too late. And that's why I think the greatest gift that we can give young people, all people of all ages, is the recognition that yes, we are living with plenty of uncertainties, but there are a few things that are absolutely 99.9% .9 certain. And if we don't acknowledge those, we're gonna be caught in the hope, fear, hope, fear, hope, fear dialectic that just creates more suffering. And mm. paradoxically has us support and cheerlead policies that actually do more ecological damage, thinking that we're doing the right thing. Yeah, so you've mentioned a couple of things there which um, I think are important to go deeper on. But before I do that, I just want to say to uh, everyone who's joined and very pleased to see 
quite a, a lot of people have joined. Um, if you'd like to ask a question uh, for Reverend Michael Dowd, then please send it to Stuart. And you'll see there it says questions, Stuart questions. Uh, and then I'll come to you in about, um, about 10, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to hear more voices. Um, also, please indicate to Stuart whether you're okay to, uh, to, to be on YouTube and please have your um, camera on. So, Michael, you've, um, yeah, you've mentioned there a couple of things. One is your, your real certainty of how um, society, what human societies face and also the benefit, um, including benefit for younger generations of recognizing that reality sooner. So I wanna, I wanna delve into those two things because there's a lot of objection in society to that, uh, to both of those things. First is to say, no, it's absolutely not too late to stop a cat cat catastrophic damage to human societies, modern consumer societies. Uh, and, um, and many people in the climate movement will say that, for example, and perhaps mm -hmm. they're just too focused only on climate when they arrive at that, no, it's not too late argument. So, and then I wanna go a little bit more into yeah, how it is actually perhaps acting in solidarity with younger generations or how you can be in solidarity with younger generations from your conclusion rather than somehow letting them down or just trying not to think about the future that they've got to live into. But first, why are you so convinced? The last nine years, the main things I've been studying, and I mean 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 hours a week and often recording the books that I've been reading, have been things like the rise and fall of literally dozens, scores of civilizations over the last 8,000 years. And what are the common patterns on the way up and what are the common patterns on the way down? And, um, and then also things like abrupt climate change where you've got runaway feedback loops, tipping points that, that the media will absolutely, and the IPCC and academics and New York Times bestselling authors will continue to speak as if these tipping points are still in the future. But we ran over that dog 20 years ago. It's, it's already in the past. So from that, the recognition, the first thing that I can say with 100% certainty is that most people will not accept anything else I say after this. <laughs> Denial is so ingrained, so, so absolutely healthy in terms of the mechanism of desial, de denial, the, why we can't accept and, and find repulsive certain ways of thinking about the future that, that, are, that mean bad things for us and our loved ones or that mean difficulties are ahead or whatever. So I want to honor that, that what I'm about to say, most people, including a lot of the people on this call, are going to say, no, doubt's crazy and be okay with that. That's 100% that's, that's certainty is that most people will not be able to accept how and why our civilization is collapsing and why it's collapsing in an already, like we're already decades into it. It's not inevitable. Collapse isn't inevitable. It's already well underway. Biospheric collapse is a couple hundred years underway. Civilizational collapse, the collapse of the stability of the Holocene, these are already in the past. But I'm also clear that the only way to have joy in times of global hospice, in times of contraction, in times of inevitable collapse, the only way to truly have joy is to truly be in the place of acceptance. I mean, collapse awareness can be hell, but collapse acceptance brings, as you just mentioned, benefits. There are certain benefits that are only possible with full collapse acceptance and the possibility, we don't know if it's an inevitability or not. I mean, we do know that extinction is an inevitability, but near term, who knows? But certainly a very real possibility. And so being aware of that and then living out of that contribution. I mean, somebody gave me a T-shirt. In fact, I'm wearing it. I'm not going to show it. But it says Tia Tawaki, the end of the world as we know it with an earth. And I sometimes, when people see me wearing that, they'll say, what's that, tea? what's Tia Tawaki? And I say, oh, it's, it's an indigenous term. It means that things are spiraling <laughs> down. It's going to get, it's going to get worse, but just find ways to be a contribution to others. You'll be okay. <laughs> mm. Because really for young people to fight and fight and fight as if solar panels and wind turbines and green new deals and energy transitions and all that is even possible is to fail to understand the main drivers of collapse and ecocide, which are technology, progress, development, human-centeredness. These are things that drive it. So that's why I'm so passionate about inviting 
people of all ages, but especially young people, to accept what's inevitable and then live out of this passionate energy to make as big a difference at whatever scale you can make a difference, but not from the place of in order to. We can let go of the in order to's because chances are pretty good, really good, like well over 60, 70%, that there's just nothing, I would say well over 90%, there's nothing we can do to slow, stop, or reverse what is at this scale, which is the collapse of the ecosphere, the collapse of the biosphere, and the collapse of industrial, what William Catton calls homo colossus. But there's tremendous amount that we can do locally to be a blessing to our communities, our neighbors, our friends, our family, and, and have tremendous joy in that process, even in the midst of collapse, even if you're going to starve next week, there's a way to live with generosity and humility and integrity that allows you to experience what could be called joy in your final week. And that's, that's what the whole post doom, no gloom sort yes. of approach is trying to be about. So you've, you've described it very well there. Thank you. And, um, and also with a, a real, a real, the, your conviction is comes across really, really, really well. And it's also a very unusual message in the climate movement and the environmental movement at present. Um, what the criticism has been is that when, when people hear that people like yourself have found a, a more peaceful, creative, kind, um, enthusiastic, collapse accepting way of being in the world, um, they, they are wondering whether it is being counterproductive because it's, it's, it's encouraging people not to do much on either grand political projects uh, or even considering any geoengineering or even considering any bold mitigation, as you mentioned, renewable energy. And so they think that, well, if there is a chance of a less bad future for young people, um, then we shouldn't just write that off. Um, and therefore it's kind of like a yes and rather than no. And, 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 and that criticism also carries quite a strong sort of sense of moral solidarity with younger generations and, and the argument, well, who are we as older people, perhaps who are more focused on our final week? Um, like who are we to decide that for them and, and turn people off political activism to try and cut carbon or draw down carbon? And so I just want to hear a bit more on that because it is something that's often put by critics of those who are collapse accepting. Sure. I can, I'm no longer trying to convince people to not be involved in anything. Whatever their heart leads them to engage in is like, I am just a big hearted, full throated, okay, go for it. Follow your heart. Um, I'm, I'm now at the place of seeing myself as a big picture cartographer. I've, I, I, I sort of describe the map. Here's where people are. Here's what people are trying to do. Here are the authors doing this and whatever. And I'm happy to share my sense. But the, the, the clearest sense that I can say is that most people still think that climate is our issue, and it's not. Climate change, as Hein Richard Heinberg regularly says, climate change is not our biggest problem. It's overshoot, ecological overshoot. And there are a dozen other things that are extinction level that are beyond. They they often include climate change and abrupt climate change, but they're bigger than that. But again, if somebody hasn't been exposed, if they haven't read William Catton's Overshoot, for example, or Teddy Goldsmith or William Ofels or some of these you know, yes, I get the white guys, but many times we white guys have, have caused so much of the problem. So it's not a surprise that some of us are at least trying to do what we can to, you know, remedy or repent or whatever, at least understand. Mm -hmm. But if somebody doesn't have a historical and ecological understanding, say, for example, why and how civilizations collapse and why never have we seen people not get out of denial, never in any previous collapse civilization, does everybody wake up and get it? It just doesn't happen. It can't happen. And so understanding that then allows me to say, okay, if someone wants to pursue with great passion, whatever it is that they want to pursue with great passion, go for it. Just know that the likelihood of you experiencing tremendous uh, angst, anguish, suffering in the not too distant future, when you see that your hopes but one of my one of my dearest colleagues, Meg Wheatley, I think she's on this call, is offering something soon on we need to talk about hope because we think of hope as a good thing. And it's a, there's a reason why hope was actually considered in the the box Pandora's box of, of, of curses. You know, we think it's a good thing, but no, it, it binds us in this. So 
Mm. Um, if Connie uses an I, analogy like an arm, like if yeah. you're up here and you still believe that it's possible to transform the system, whether through technology or energy transit or whatever, you're going to resent people down here that are saying, no, it's, it's just too late for that. And so I know that people will resent me for being in this place of collapse acceptance and collapse, not just collapse acceptance, collapse trust that it, that it now couldn't be otherwise because of these reinforcing feedbacks that are already so unstoppable um, that things will continue to get yes. worse. But the, there's a couple of things that come to mind there. One is, um, so when my deep adaptation paper came out and took off, um, and I was surprised that quite a lot of people were, were responding to that by deciding to quit their jobs and become full-time activists, and they joined Extinction Rebellion, which was very focused at the time publicly, even though privately a lot of people were focused more on adaptation or resilience or the emotional and psychological side, some of this more post-doom stuff. Uh, but publicly, it was very focused on uh, carbon cuts, emissions reductions, mm -hmm. and being bold on that. And I felt that I, I couldn't turn away from that. I thought, well, yeah. they, you know, and I, and my speech at the opening of the rebellion was saying, you know, we, we, we're we're protesting not because we believe in a fairy tale future where we fix climate change, but activism on mitigation is part of a broader response to waking up to the predicament. And it is, well, if there's any chance of a slightly less bad future, we need to try. And, and in that sense, I was not talking about preserving societies as we experience them today, um, but hoping that, yeah, the hope is there. And so it is a wish, it is wishful thinking, but not detached from then analysis and action. So a kind of hope that, there might be some kind of future uh, for some people uh, after the collapse of industrial consumer societies. And that, yeah, I felt like, well, supporting that, even though, as you say, you can get really into that in ways which can add to your angst, where you end up living in a constant sense of struggle and disappointment. And so there's a real, there is a real issue there. And Deborah Zarko, Deborah Zarko has talked about it, about, well, a lot of activism can be a form of distraction, a form of avoiding extremely difficult emotions about how things are and are going to be. So um, for me, I'm, I've still tried to be both. <laughs> yeah, so both, both uh, activism on mitigation, but also this, this broader agenda. And I appreciate that a lot of people think, well, that's that's maybe not where the most energy now needs to be. And, and I realize you've got to that, that point, yeah, where you, you've said, I mean, so in your estimation then, what, what is most important and urgent to do? Um, you know, if people were fed up with their XR activism on mitigation, <laughs> what's most yeah. urgent and important for them to do now? Yeah. That's a great question, Jim. Um, first of all, to recognize that the, uh, I no longer say we must do anything or we need to do anything. I, I have completely rejected the notion of the, what I call the almighty we, that there is a we in any meaningful sense that has agency over the things that are literally already completely out of our control. For example, the idea that we can still lessen emissions is to completely understand that the boreal forests in Siberia and Canada are already carbon sources. They're not carbon sinks, as is the Amazon. That the forests of the world are already in what could be called the great conflagration. They're going to keep burning and burning bigger and stronger and more intense every year. Um, the bleaching of the coral reefs and on and on. I'm not going to do a whole litany of the bad news, but suffice it to say that if every human being died tonight in our sleep, carbon emissions and nitrous oxide and methane would continue to rise for the next decades, if not longer than that, based on already natural systems that are already in runaway mode. So the question then becomes for me, how do I be with that in ways that still allow me to pass the mirror test? Because we all have to pass the mirror test. We have to look at ourselves in the mirror and feel like we're not 
bad or evil or whatever. And so that's where making the, the individual lifestyle choices, becoming vegan or flying less or not flying at all, driving less or not driving at all, et cetera. These are all things that aren't going to save the world, but they're going to help save your soul, maybe. And those they're going to help you pass the mirror test. They're going to help you feel good about yourself. The same thing with activism, being engaged in any form. I like to call it love and action because it's not so much desperate activism based on sort of like in order to or fear. It's like, oh, <laughs> things are spiraling. Uh, that's unstoppable. And I need to be active to be able to pass the mirror test. And more than that, because that's what gives my life joy is contributing to others, other species, as my wife, Connie, is trying to assist trees in migrating faster than any other animal or whatever. So to come yeah, back to your question, you. what do I invite people to do is to be to, to recognize, first of all, to recognize that climate isn't our issue. Overshoot is and 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 it's it's extinction level at multiple levels. Certain things are already in runaway mode. And so do the grief work, the heart work, the sadness work to be with that. And then just find every possible way that you can to be a compassionate, generous contribution to your community, because that's what's going to give you joy. That's what's going to make a difference. And that's what's going to probably be the thing that does whatever passes through this bottleneck. It may be your compost in the backyard. You may make it possible for certain microbes or worms to pass through this bottleneck that wouldn't otherwise. So we could all participate in the regenerative dynamics of planet Earth and do what we can to resist evil. And what I mean by evil is that which diminishes or destroys or degrades ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. So I don't, I do think it's possible to have a less bad future, but good and bad are defined as ecological integrity social coherence and personal wholeness. So anything you do to enrich or enhance or support or further ecological integrity, social coherence and personal wholeness is good. And I think that as things collapse, for example, we're not going to see an entire generation of young men being addicted to internet porn and internet gaming. It's not going to happen when their communities need them. So we're about to come to questions from our, our uh, the group of... Uh, people who've joined us today. Um, but first, uh, I want to say, ask you something specifically about where you're getting to talking about evil. Um, I was wondering, how do you understand aspects of your Christian faith or the Christian faith um, or the gospel um, that you think are especially helpful or important or in light of what we've covered, in light of your ecological and evolutionary worldview and the belief that you have that we're in it could be called the end times to use to use yeah. the religious framing. Yeah, yeah. Wow, great question. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let me shift gears. In a nutshell, I became a religious naturalist in 1988 when I was introduced to Thomas Berry's work, the whole universe story or epic of evolution. I found that I continued to find great value in religious and spiritual traditions, including my own Christianity, but I had also drunk deeply at Taoism and Buddhism and, and certainly indigenous forms of spirituality or life ways. But I no longer interpreted and I no longer interpret now any of the mythic concepts of my tradition as otherworldly or supernatural. I interpret them as saying something poetic about this one reality in which we live and move and have our being. Uh, that is our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end, and spiritual creator, sustainer, and end. And so I, I find that now the religious traditions, I think, are needed more than ever, not to transform the system, that ain't going to happen, but to help us all to collapse with dignity, to collapse with integrity, to collapse with generosity, to contract and possibly even go extinct with love, with kindness, um, with humility. And I, and I'm, I believe that this is a time of to use religious language that virtually everybody in this call is going to say, what the? You know, repentance. To repent is to simply say, I was wrong. We were wrong. We thought this, we were going this direction. We now see that was actually harmful. And so I'm now choosing this direction or to think this way or to act this way. So that kind of repentance and supporting us in being kind and generous and compassionate with each other in the contracting process, we need our religious traditions more than ever, it seems to me, and spiritual traditions and spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. And what I found quite powerful is that where you've got to is from this collapse acceptance place and the message you're bringing is, is actually one that, that has been brought before about what's in your heart and to, to return to love and, and to 
to live from the heart. So, um, yeah, that's really good to, to hear. We're going to go to questions now. For now, we'll go to Gary. Uh, Gary Hoover, could you switch on your, your video and your audio and ask a question? Sure. question? Sure. Yeah, I would like to hear more about psychological overshoot. In particular, I'm wondering, is this both an individual and collective phenomenon? But maybe just say more about what you think psychological overshoot is. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. And, and I can almost hear Connie cheering you in the background because the, really she and I have been talking about this just in the last few days. And it was originally her concept. She said, what about psychological overshoot? Why aren't you giving attention to that? And I'm like, wow, that's powerful. I hadn't thought about it. So as I understand it, or I'm thinking about it now, and this is very new, is that there are limits to human nature individually and collectively. There's limits to what is possible for humans in groups and limits to po what's possible as humans. And because our instincts, which are just as strong as any animal's instincts, evolved to serve us in healthy tribal cultures in groups of 150 or less that are ecologically, you know, that, that are that attend to ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness as uh, as a top priorities. So our instincts evolve, but now we're living in these anonymous societies, technologically driven. We don't know how to communicate. We don't know how to deal with the fact that there are so many, even organizations that have no understanding of evolution are all too fine of using evolutionary drivers and mechanisms and hooks to get us addicted to this, that, or the other thing. So that's what I mean. Psychological overshoot is when we've overshoot overshot the carrying capacity, <laughs> to use that language, but the, the grace limits of human nature individually and collectively, such that we now experience more and more problems as a result of technology, energy, uh, societal complexity, and so forth. So do you think that overshoot primarily has to do with um, the, the huge technological culture we're in, or, or do we go into overshoot when we begin to consider extinction, like near-term immediate human extinction, does that put us into a kind of overshoot that we're not designed for? That's an interesting question. I don't think so, because for almost all of human history, you knew that you and your people, if you had a bad harvest, could die next winter or this winter. You know, there was not that sense of this entitlement that we have, that we are entitled to live a long life. There was much more of a sense of fragility and the, and, the, and that basically to treat any year as if it's just one year in a decades long life is to misunderstand the nature of reality, a disease, a war, famine, whatever. So, no, I don't think so. But I do think that, yes, technology and the secular religion of perpetual progress have driven us to the brink of now dealing with psychological and, and, and sociological overshoot. So it's that combination, really, of... Yeah one setting think, us up i think so yeah okay thanks Great. thank thanks, you gary me. um so we're gonna go to stuart actually because i quite liked your question even though you're working with me on the call uh, stuart is a thanks. member of the deep adaptation forum and moderator of the deep adaptation facebook group um, which uh how many members are there on that now stuart uh we're marching on towards about sixteen thousand members now Right. Beautiful. Okay. So your question. Yeah. <laughs> so my question, Michael, and thanks for your chat so far. Um, if this is also inevitable, um, and to be clear, I'm on the same page as you about this. Uh, so this is a question I ask myself often. What is the value in bringing people to collapse awareness, and how do you deal with the responsibility, given that many people may not be equipped to consider it fully? So just yeah, that's to a... repeat that, because there was, in, with my internet connection, there was a slight crackle or break. So I'll just repeat it just in case that happened for others. Um, yeah, as you believe collapse is inevitable, um, what's the point of bringing people to that awareness? And also, what's the responsibility, given that perhaps many people uh, won't be able to, 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 to process that and, and live with it? And I... I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, That's I a fabulous, I, it's a fabulous I question. I just, for me, talking to publicly about this was an accident, really. I didn't realize the DA paper would go wild. And uh, 
but yeah, Michael. Yeah. Well, Great question, Stuart. And um, I, that's one of the reasons why I've shifted from being a collapse or post doom, or, I mean, you can't get to post doom without at least going through a little bit of doom, but I, I no longer view it as my role to wake people up. Because there's two schools of thought. One is allow people to be in whatever form of just, it's not even, denial gets a bad rap. It's often adaptive inattention. They know that, you know, we all feel the stress. We all feel the anxiety. We, many of us feel the grief, et cetera. And yet for many people, they know that whatever the circumstances of their life, their kids, their grandkids, their work situation, their own, whatever, to fully accept what I'm calling inevitable and unstoppable and already underway would be so emotionally challenging that they, they don't know that they would, they don't have confidence they'd function on a day by day basis and they may be right. And so I, I'm now in the place where I plant seeds, every conversation that I'm in publicly or privately, I'm always planting seeds, but I'm not doing usually more than that because even my sort of humorous way of saying what Tia Tawaki is, you know, well, it means things are going to spiral down, probably going to get worse, but find ways to be a contribution to others. You'll be fine. You know, even that kind of humorous sort of uh, sidestepping, I do partly because I trust people's process and timing. And when they're ready for a deeper conversation or deeper understanding, I've got an entire, my post-Doom resources page on the post-Doom website is chock full of my own and other people's best of the best of the best stuff, audio, video, documentaries, podcasts, whatever. So there's plenty of stuff out there. But my... My desire at this point for the foreseeable future isn't to talk about that. It's mostly as my next series will be, which is an educational series designed for small group discussion, skills of post-doom, no gloom living. So obviously there'll be a little bit there about how we got in this mess and whatever, but my focus, 90% of it is, okay, however you understand our predicament, whatever your sense of inevitability or likely or possible or whatever there are certain skills that we know from history and science of the last 200 years that facilitate wholeness and health individually and collectively. And so what are the skill sets that can be nourished and supported each other and taught that allow for truly skills of post-doom, no gloom living and loving? So that's what I really focus on now. And it's like, I'm not trying to convert people because some people probably need to stay in denial as long as possible. Yeah, that's that's how I rationalize the fact that because myself and many other people weren't doing any mainstream media outreach, that people would only hear about so-called doomers or um, deep adapters, deep adapters um, through people who were slagging us off in the mainstream media. And I thought, well, at least it means only those people who are ready will actually Google it, look us up, and learn more and uh, engage. It was the safest way of, of the world learning about this. However, now, as, as you say, things begin to unravel and we face all manner of uh, really terrifying situations around the world. And um, I think there is more of an argument for outreach and uh, helping people rationalize this and notice their emotional reactions and so on. We're going to go to Jessica. Um, Jessica. Hang on, just one second, uh, Jim, just well, before yeah. Jessica's question, I just want to mention one thing important that Connie just reminded me of, is that <clears throat> we often think about it only in the negative, but there are certain benefits. My, my colleagues, uh, uh, Karen and Jordan Perry, have done a lot with this, and I recommend my post-Doom uh, conversations with them, but the benefits that really are only possible with collapse acceptance and collapse trust, they don't, you know, these benefits are not available to a person when they're in simply collapse understanding it's only with collapse acceptance and so and one of them is the clarity that comes from understanding the historical and ecological nature of our predicament the confusion goes away and the clarity is like oh my god of course of course of course we're in this mess of course of course of course the corporations are trying to get me to believe this way of course of course of course the media i mean it's like when with that of course of course of courseness confusion is replaced with clarity and then yeah. the blame game which is what most of us have we're trying to blame evaporates for compassion so i so, I, I really want to focus on the benefits okay so all right i will um i'll put a link into that collapse acceptance piece and also my piece on why should we talk publicly about collapse yeah jessica 
Hi, good morning. Thank you, Jem and Michael. Uh, I'm coming from Dominica the, in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, Michael, I really appreciate all of the work that you've done and the, and the post-doom conversations. I, I love those. Um, my question for you is really around sort of the, I love the idea that we can be compassionate and we should be focusing on social justice and community, but how, how are we to continue to do that in the face of expanding empire? and war and with this political instability um, that is now really bearing down on us um, existential questions about nuclear war um, how are we how can this be maintained in terms of social justice and addressing loss and damage um, the global north the responsibility to the global south um, when they're so busy, uh, you know, expanding empire uh, and grabbing the, the rest of the resources and controlling, um, you know, how industrial civilization is going to play itself out. How, how, do, how can we address and really collapse uh, in a way that's... Yeah, what a, what a kick butt question. That is absolutely fabulous. So all I can share is how I approach that. I can't say what will work for others, but for me... A, I recognize the unstoppability of it, that the empire is going to con continue to do what empires go always do, that Homo Colossus is going to continue to use political power and corruption and, and e economic unfairness and injustice. And all those are literally unstoppable. And, and, and so if I invest in trying to stop that or keep that from happening, I'm going to drive myself nuts. So that's the first place. The second is to look at the scale and and the the communities and the scale at which I can make a difference, in which I can alleviate suffering, in which I can do something to right injustice, where I can be a contribution. So at the scale and the and the the locale where that is possible, and frankly, the last is really for me vital because it gives me a sense of trust that actually is soul nourishing, which is gallows humor. Connie and I don't take our lives for granted. We treat each season as if it could be our last. I'm living two blocks. We're living two blocks from our two and a half year old granddaughter. Obviously, I want things to continue for decades. Do I think they will? No, I don't. Or at least they won't for most people. But nonetheless, I'm committed to doing everything I can to live with as much um, contribution to my community at the scale that I can to, to confront things that deserve being confronted at the scale that I can. But basically, uh, I regularly remind ourselves, in fact, when anybody's talking about what's, what they think is going to happen 5, 10, 20 years down, I'll usually whisper over to Connie, it's just a little piece of gallows humor. And I'll say, yeah, unless we've all boiled like lobsters or starved by then. And it's just a way of introducing a little bit of like gallows humor, I think, is really vital in the stages of grief. Beyond acceptance, beyond trust is that sense that, yes, and so I treat... I treat I treat my community, my neighborhood as sacred, but I also know that I could die in the next year or two. And and Connie, we wake up each morning. We Thank only you. started this. Thank week. you, Michael. Wait, 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 wait I'm just a second. Conscious of wait, time wait, 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 Jeb, Jeb, Jeb. Yes, Jeb, just a second. Connie wakes up and says, Wow, we didn't die in the nuclear holocaust last night. We get to live another day. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, you have a it sounds like you have a fun time. So <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Oh, I'll, I don't. That I'll. I'll have to write a note by my bed to remind myself to to be grateful like that. Jessica, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's a couple of things there that I, I'd, I'd like to hear. Yeah, I mean, I I think that that's very good for your you know heart and soul and spirit, and I can see that that would be healthy personally. But I my question is really, what responsibility do you have in terms of communicating sort of the injustice kind of of our predicament uh, in respect to um, the inequality, um, the post-colonial reality that we're living in, and uh, the fact that people in the global south have been suffering, you know, already from collapses and will continue to suffer um, in larger numbers, um, and bringing that into the the narrative, I guess, in terms of yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Michael, I'll I'll just come in on on that because sure. I do see that um a a, a a place of collapse acceptance can be all the things that I'm reading about in terms of um, living in gratitude, in full presence, um, 
letting go of your old stories of what was right or wrong and, and, and what to work towards and being, and being in solidarity with your community and reverent towards nature. And I also think that doesn't seem enough. Um, there's also, uh, uh, there, are, there are people right now who's, um, who are being poisoned, uh, who's, who are being moved off their lands, who are facing starvation. And so there's, there is, it, it might not be political activism towards emissions cuts and drawdown, but there could be a political activist agenda for people who are collapse accepting. And that's why I'm fascinated by this initiative out of Australia, the Just Collapse Guys, um, where they're saying, actually, let's not just turn away from political action because we're collapse accepting. And so that Jessica, you mentioned, for example, this whole idea within climate policy around uh, financing loss and damage. And so recognizing that there are communities, the most affected people in communities of the world suffering right now. And so why do we not prioritize that rather than just prioritizing putting in tens of millions into direct air capture machines and, and such like. So Michael, your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, well, I think exactly what Jessica's pointing to is precisely what many, many, many people within the collapse acceptance community still feel convicted of the heart to be engaged in, which is to address injustice wherever and however it it's occurring. And exactly what you've said. And so, Jem, it's the same thing for you. It's like whatever a person's heart leads them to engage with, they just can't live with themselves because they see this tremendous I will use the word evil. We're dealing with a uh, one of the most influential books I've ever read is Jack Forbes' uh, book, uh, Columbus and Other Cannibals, that we're dealing with a six or 7,000 year process of wetico, wetico, which is this, this virus of the mind that human centeredness is. And yes, there are systems of evil and exploitation and injustice and toxicity, and it's just everywhere. And anything that we can do as individuals or groups to address that is going to be holy work. Again, though, to do it without a sense that this is going to necessarily transform the systems, because if it if you believe that it will transform things and allow for this evil to continue into the future, I, I just don't see that as happening. I see that we are homo colossus is destined for near-term extinction, and trying to make it so that it survives on life support just makes things worse, which is not to say to not address everything you are. But I, I can't. I have no desire to try to be a we, that we should address this or we should address that. I don't think there's a meaningful we beyond groups that are actually still self-organizing multicellular organisms, which are mostly indigenous communities. That's why they're leading the, the that's why they're leading this. Sorry, can you just sorry, you, you said you don't you don't see a, a a sense in talking about a we beyond what scale of human community? I don't find the universal we, that we should do this or we should do that, useful. That's all. I just don't find it useful because any concept of we that's not being used as a multicellular organism, that is a group that's functioning as a unit, which industrial society is not, the exact opposite of that, is, is almost always a delusion in the sense that it, it gives us the sense that we have agency at a scale that we actually don't, and it just means greater suffering. Yeah, but I mean, your computer was made on the other side of the world, and it's got metals in it, which were pulled out of Africa, and we're, we're very connected. It, it doesn't, we're, we're constantly connected. That was it Martin Luther King said, before the end of breakfast, we've depended on half the world. So I, I think there are those relationships that we are participating in. And yes, I'm totally with you in terms of relocalizing. And, um, but in the, the, the relocalization book, in the deep adaptation edited book I did, we also then talk about not turning away. Uh, so there's, I think, a phrase that sometimes uses is, is, is a cosmolocalism. So that sort of global solidarity, but as well as the, 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 the relocalization. Um, because yeah, it's, uh, well, I, I agree with all of that, Jim. I just, the, the common perception is that the, the, the global South is going to suffer, uh, worse than the global North. And that's absolutely already the case. And the global North is so dependent upon complex supply chains and everything else that over the course of literally the next three or four years, we are likely to see 
a collapse of so much that we in the so-called developed, so-called privileged world are actually much closer to famine and death uh, than uh, many peoples around the world that still live with some connection to the land. Yeah, it's a, there is certainly a, a lack of understanding of how vulnerable people living in uh, urban industrial consumer societies are. Jessica, any thoughts on that? Because then we'll, we'll uh, be coming to a close. Yeah. No, I, I think it's I think it needs more more food for thought, but maybe at another time. Thank you, Michael. Mm. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. And, and Jessica, um, I would be I would love to be in conversation with you, perhaps and Jim, just on this topic that we lean into this and that I learn from you because right now I've got my own blinders, what I've been engaged in for the last 10, 20 years, what especially the last three or four years in terms of post doom no gloom. And I'm happy to be educated on this from you and others. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, my sense is it, it really is a, you know, what is a global justice agenda for people who are truly collapse accepting? Um, how can one uh, try beyond one's nearest and dearest and neighbours and all of that, which is really important, without driving, what was it you said, driving oneself nuts, nuts and, and uh, feeling like one is pushing against this uh, impossible imperial juggernaut um and perhaps well just helping you know community communities contacting each other from around the world and acting in solidarity in a bilateral way might be uh, one straightforward way of of acting but yeah thanks for bringing this up jessica it's really important stuff and michael for being open for further dialogue on it i think it's really important thank you everyone for joining um we'll uh, be back together in about a month i'm going to be hosting joe uh, joe confino uh, uh, who's former uh, Guardian uh, editor and Huffington Post editor, now lives in Plum Village. Uh, and so we'll be exploring um, his journey in terms of collapse as well. So thanks again, and Michael. Jim, I, I just want to say, uh, you, yes. you specifically and your whole Deep Adaptation Forum, the whole Deep Adaptation world, were one of the main inspirations for me for even launching the whole post-doom, no gloom project and conversations. And it was people like yourself and, and uh, Dar Jamel and Barbara Cecil and Catherine Ingram that were really, Stan Rushworth, were really the, the foundational sort of heart space for me to even engage in this. So I just deep bow of respect to you as an older, even though I'm older than you in physical years, mm. you're an older brother than me on this path. So thank you. This sounds brilliant. I can retire then knowing uh, this is all in good hands. <laughs> all right. Uh, cheers. Thanks for that, Michael. Bye-bye everyone.